Good. All right, so I'm slowly going to start. We have 11 attendees, which is uh, nice. Good morning to the ones from overseas and good afternoon to the ones based in uh, Europe. We started contemplating uh, on writing a report on trust back in spring 2018. And um, since then, we've just been reconfirmed again and again and again. That has actually been a very good idea to, to highlight um, trust and the transformation uh, of trust as, as a theme. Um, I don't know, uh, at least from a Danish perspective, we've seen during the, the, the last couple of months, it's, it's almost been like waking up to a new day of trust breach bingo kind of thing. There's been so many situations in the media where established um, established players, established trust keepers have simply defaulted on um, their responsibility in terms of, uh, of uh, facilitating trust. And not to mention all the defaults, but here are a few of the headlines that I, I just chose to include in this presentation. So we had a few years back, we had the, first of all the Panama Papers, which were then followed about uh, followed by the Paradise Papers uh, about data breeds and tax fraud and tax uh, avoiding taxes and, and whatnot. And then we had the scandal with Cambridge Analytica and Facebook, how according, according to some sources at least, it, it helped decide the US election in favor of uh, the US president. And we've had the whole theme around fake news. We've had several data breaches from, uh, from uh, huge organizations. And, and, and lately in Denmark, we've had a huge scandal with uh, banks, international banks who um, have been accused of money laundering. And we've, we, we've seen um, banks and lawyers and, and, and speculants how they've, um, how they've how to put this, like they've, they've uh, cheated European governments for m several billions worth of, of, of tax, uh, tax money. So we've just been reconfirmed again and again that, tra uh, that uh, right now we're seeing an implosion of trust as Edelman put it in the, in the yearly trust barometer. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that's, that's on the agenda out there. <clears throat> Moving on a little bit to the next slide, and this is actually from the Edelman Trust Barometer, and it shows the trust levels across governments, media, NGOs, and businesses aggregated. And as you see, like Edelman coined the, the, the phrase in an implosion of trust. And as you see, many of our Western democracies are actually distrusters, is the way they put it. Like we have very low trust levels and it's, you know, it's democracies, it's Western democracies who are, are supposed to have stable systems, stable organization that we can, we can put our trust in. And even our neighbors, the Danish neighbors, Sweden, who's, you know, like Denmark, like Norway, like most of the, the rest of the Scandinavian countries are based on a system where trust is, is simply essential for the whole welfare system has very low trust levels. So this is again to tell the story that trust is eroding and it, it, it's really becoming a burning platform for the established trust keepers, um, trust players. So how do we define trust in this report? So we have two types of trust. We, we have the individual trust, the interpersonal trust, which essentially is, is, is the trust that we have in individuals, in each other. and in the community. And then we distinguish between individual trust and institutional trust slash system trust, which is more trust in, in systems and in uh, how private and public institutions handle trust. So we make that distinction. And in this report, we are mainly or actually only looking at trust at the institutional level and not at the individual level. That has to be a, uh, an upcoming members report, maybe. So 
why is it so important that we trust in our central institutions? That is because it's the whole foundations from how we've built our uh, societies. And it's really, really important from what, in, at least in Denmark, we call the social contract. So the contract between the population and the central uh, institutions. Um, and we've been looking at three different ways of keeping trust, of organizing trust. And on the left, we have sort of the normal or the, the, the system that we're used to where we have central institutions that we put our trust in. That could be governments, that could be big businesses, that could be any central trust uh, player, so to speak. It could be um, the police, it could be the court system, it could be banks and whatnot. And then as we've seen more and more digitalization of um, our society, then this new sort of new form of trust, which we call platform facilitated trust, a new way of establishing and keeping trust has emerged. And if you look at the picture, you'll see that it's sort of decentralized, but still, still centralized in a way. So these platforms, it could be, the common example would be Airbnb. It is a platform that facilitates trust. So you essentially have the trust in the peer-to-peer -peer network and you will allow a complete stranger to, to rent your apartment and sleep in, in your bed. So this is how platforms can facilitate trust. But as you also see from the picture, there is still at least some sort of a central entity, the platform. You would still have to trust that Airbnb or any other platform um, with your data and, and that they don't misuse your data. Um, so it's it's still centralized in a in a in in, in one way as you still have to have trust in in the central player, but it facilitates trust so that I as an individual can trust a an, another individual that I've never met based on peer to peer ratings. So if if fifty other people has rated this person to be trustworthy and uh, given them five stars because they taking good care of uh, their apartment, then I would also put my, my trust in that, even though I've never met the person in, uh, in person. And then what we're seeing right now is, and, th and that's very, very much driven by new technologies that I'll talk more about later, but that's a shift towards trust in, in what we call distri distributed networks. So technologies such as, uh, as blockchain allows what can you say, like the transformation of trust. So you, deal, you don't trust the central institution, but you trust sort of the protocol, the network that verifies uh, what is going on. So essentially, as you see, the central trust keeper is, is, is kind of taken away from how, um, from, the, from this uh, distributed trust paradigm. I'll talk more about the technologies um, in a minute. And just basically to give you a, a, an example of how to think about this distributed trust as an alternative, I've, I've brought this example and it's about decentralized cloud storage. So cloud storage is, is, is a market that it's gonna be, today it's already extremely valuable and it's gonna be even more valuable as we, you know, more and more of our daily activities migrate online and we, you all heard the story about how much data we produce and whatnot. But right now, the cloud storage market is dominated by all the digital giants like Amazon, Google, Apple, um, and actually Amazon. They make most of you, you, they make most of the money from their uh, cloud services. But the thing is, these giants they have full control of the data that we've put in their cloud. So we will have to trust these entities, these central entities um, that they don't misuse our data. And I don't know about you guys, but I wouldn't really be surprised if let's say tomorrow I opened the paper and it says that Amazon cloud services has had a huge data breach or something. It, it's, it's along the lines of what happened with uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So you'll have to have trust in today's system in these 
central entities to uh, to to uh, to to uh, to keep your trust and and uh, and your data. So what's new about this whole decentralized way of thinking is that we we're seeing now new actors that offers blockchain based cloud solutions and the way that it works is essentially that I personally I might have excess space on my hard drive so I can rent that excess space out put it in the network and if another individual somewhere else in the world needs to to save some files or some data what's going to happen is that that individual's data is going to be distributed in small um, in small pieces onto maybe a thousand different computers in the network so i would only have a tiny tiny fraction of that data uh, on my computer that is completely useless to me and once it's it's got obviously going to be encrypted and then spread out distributed in the network and once that individual needs its uh, his or her data back it's going to be compiled into in, into one file again so as you see now you no longer place your data with a central uh, entity such as amazon but it's actually distributed across maybe a thousand nodes maybe even more nodes in a network that makes it much more secure and much more trustworthy when when you think about you 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 are moving the trust from the central actor to the network or to the protocol and the thing about a central actor is also that it it's essentially one point of failure so to speak so if someone um, manages to hack amazon's databases then that's one point of failure in order to to hack my files that's distributed across a network um, that person would have to hack thousand different computers to get the full picture so that in, in that sense it's much more secure as well and i brought a uh, another example on how this decentralized way of thinking of establishing trust translate into new ways of um, um, of thinking about social media social platform so there's this this again this is just an example it, it's not very well established yet it, it, the network effect hasn't really kicked in so uh, uh, as of this moment it's not really a competitor to facebook and other social medias but it's it's a different way of thinking about um, the social media so this is a blogging site called steemit and it's the users who who uh, puts content on the network and it's the users also who decides if the content is good or if it's bad. So you can, if you think, let's say an article is, is, is good information, then you upvote that article. And the, the author of the article is then, um, um, he gets, he gets um, what can you say, like he, he gets paid if other people upvote his content, while me, as a guy who upvoted that content are also getting paid if content that I've already upvoted get, gets upvoted more. So that's an interesting way of creating incentives, incentives to, uh, to upvote good content and essentially downvote fake news or spam or commercials or whatever. And again, there's no central actor that needs to monetize on your Data. So again, it's 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 a new way of thinking about how a centralized actor is is uh, switched with uh, a decentralized way of thinking, a decentralized network. <clears throat> All right. So when we see a shift in this trust paradigm, I've already talked about one of uh, well, what we see as sort of the push factor which is this burning platform of, of of trust of mistrust and then we see these new trust enabling technologies of sort of the, the the pull factor so these technologies allows us to establish and 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 maintain trust in new ways and obviously one of the things that we've we're talking about in this report one of the new technologies is blockchain another one Another new technology that, that's central in, the, in this whole paradigm shift is the idea of um, digital identity. 
And of course, there's, there's, it's, it's when all these technologies such as you know, artificial intelligence, IoT, blockchain, digital identities, it's, it's when they converge that this paradigm shift happens, but we simply had, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't write about everything in this report. So we kept, uh, we, we stayed with and, and focused on blockchain and digital identity as, as the two most important uh, developments within this space. But first, I'm actually going to take you a little bit back in time and tell you about the double entry bookkeeping, why you might think. But back 600 years ago, when the double entry bookkeeping was introduced as a way of establishing and understanding and creating transparency around companies' values, it was it was a huge paradigm shift in, in, in sort of eliminating uncertainty. And it allowed, um, what can you say? It, it allowed a common way of thinking and a common way of, of establishing trust in what companies presented was actually, well, when they presented their the books, it was actually how it was. Um, so it, it sort of became a trust establishing tool so to speak, the, the, the double entry bookkeeping. And that was a huge thing when it was introduced. And we still have it as one of the central mechanisms today. And around this trust creating tool, um, we've, we've seen the establishment of, of, um, of middlemen, of third parties, uh, trusted third parties like accountants, like lawyers, like, like banks and whatnot. Um, but we've also seen the weaknesses of the double entry bookkeeping and, and, and this established system, but because we've seen loads of examples of companies that are essentially cooking the books and giving the wrong impression of, of what the company actually, the state of the company looks like. <clears throat> so you might, I can put it this way, actually, that what is, what, what's, you know, this new trust paradigm, how does that, how does that compare to uh, a new way of, of uh, establishing companies' assets and debts from 600 years ago? The new thing is that in the new paradigm, you don't necessarily need trusted third parties because you now can trust in the protocol. Um, so that's the new way of this. And that was essentially the fundamental idea behind uh, the internet. So the, in, the, the idea behind the internet was that we don't need any central institution to manage uh, access to data or access to knowledge and access to information. So this whole decentralized way of thinking and the democratizing way of thinking was something that was actually fundamental behind the whole idea of the internet. Um, then, of course, I know that uh, the reality is that we have these digital giants who actually managed to to exploit this whole idea and, and create extremely powerful uh, monopolies. But that's, that's a whole different um, story, I would say. So blockchain, um, what is it? Um, it's actually turning, uh, the blockchain is turning 10 years, the technology is turning 10 years this year. And I want to establish right away, actually, most of you probably know this already, but it's very important for me to establish that blockchain and Bitcoin is not the same at all. So today, when we talk about or when people talk about blockchain, it's, it's, it's very often in association with Bitcoin and it, it's, they are used inter interchangeably, the two uh, things, but that's simply wrong. Yes, blockchain was the technology behind big Bitcoin. And I, I like to think about Bitcoin as a some sort of proof of concept of what the technology is actually capable of. Um, but it is one of the most hyped uh, technologies right now. And that is because you can refer to it as a technology with built-in trust. And that is simply because of the transparency the immutability and the increased efficiency that it, it that it provides, and most importantly, the whole distributed nature, the, the distributed way of thinking, taking trust from centralized institution and transforming it into the protocol, 
into the network way of thinking. So let me try to explain in a very, very simple manner what blockchain is, what the blockchain technology really is. So I hope it's not, you know, I'm not trying to patronize or anything here, but I'm trying to, to do it as simple as possible. So I see right now that there's, hope, there's luckily there's still 10 people linked up to this call. So right now you are my distributed network, the 10 of you. Then imagine that you all, all of you have a little black, black book. And in, in that black book, you write down that Simon is now going to transfer 100 krona to, uh, to uh, his brother. Let's, <laughs> let's say that. So you're noting that in your book. So that's 10 people noting that transaction in each one of your books. And then I'm going to collect or uh, the system is going to collect each one of those books, put it into a box, seal it, timestamp it, and then give each one of you a copy of that box. So each one of you nodes in the network now have a copy of the block in the chain with uh, the transaction written down on 10 different, in 10 different uh, books. So when I come back, and I want to say that, oh, it wasn't actually a hundred kroner that I transferred to my, bro to my brother. It was actually a thousand kroner. Then we can open the box. We can open the books and say, no, it was 10 or it was a hundred kroner because we've written it down, all of us. So that's the power of the network. In order to manipulate that transaction, I would need to ma manipulate 10 different books instead of, let's say, one central actor that might have an interest in in changing the information that was written down in the first place. So that's the whole transparency and the immutability and distributed nature of the blockchain. I hope it at least made some sort of sense. If not, I'm confident that it'll make more sense when you read the report. We have a very nice figure in, uh, in the report. But again, blockchain is not Bitcoin and blockchain is not only confined to let's say the financial institutions, the, the financial space, it's actually about any exchange of any sort of value uh, and information. So it could be, we could talk about how blockchain could um, make supply, global supply chain much more efficient, how we could share personal health data, how it could be used in elections uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm going to give you an example here about how blockchain is is uh, blockchain solutions can massively simplify or has the potential to met to, to massively uh, simplify global supply chain. And the example the example that I've put here is Maersk and IBM. They've partnered up uh, around this um, blockchain supply chain solution um, to increase control reduced friction and in, in, in increased transparency in, uh, in um, global supply chains. And just to give you an idea how tedious and how slow and how complex global supply chains are as of today, I think it was World Economic Forum who came with this example a few years ago that to ship a container with avocados and roses from Kenya to the Netherlands, that involves almost 30 people and organizations, and it actually generates a pile of papers that are almost 25 centimeters uh, high. And it takes, you know, out of the 34 days in, tra in transit, 10 of those days may be spent on waiting for documents to be processed. So that's very, very inefficient, the way global supply chains work today. And blockchain solutions um, could reduce friction a whole lot and increase transparency a whole lot. So that gives an example how blockchain can be used outside the sphere of uh, the financial sector. Another example of how blockchain can be utilized is in uh, elections, in general elections. Mm -hmm. And in a country that are probably not very famous of uh, established institutions and trustworthy institutions, uh, Sierra Leone, um, there was an experiment uh, with registering votes on a blockchain-based system. I know it, it was only on a test basis, but still 
when you when you have a blockchain solution and you merge it with let's say biometrics it's a way of allowing one person with, with one fingerprint to cast one vote that cannot be changed because it's 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 stored in the blockchain and that's very very powerful in terms of um, general elections in in countries that uh, are, are trying or are struggling with corruption and fraud uh, and, and whatnot and we don't even have Sweden as a very good example actually they had their general elections um, a few months back and I think it was in uh, I think it was in the in Gothenburg when they were to uh, to present the the results it it came to light that actually the national or, or a person wrongly sent the the local results in as national results and it had to uh, to 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 be recounted and come back and it actually switched one mandate in the, the Swedish Riksdag and in the Swedish parliament, that would never have happened if, if uh, the votes, votes were cast in a blockchain solutions. So you eliminate human error as, as, as well. So when we talk about blockchain, I also have to, man to, to mention the concept of uh, smart contracts. They are extremely powerful smart contracts um, because it's essentially when an event happens, this smart contract executes automatically. So you no longer need a trusted third party to, to, to execute something for you. But when a certain event that's written down and coded in this smart contract, when that happens, it's enforced and executed automatically, um, which is very, very efficient compared to, to including a, a trusted third party. Um, and an example of that, actually, we, we, my colleague and me, we, we flew to Oslo last week to, um, to present the members report live. And AXA, as you probably know, is one of the biggest uh, insurance companies um, in the world. And they are currently testing out this beta version of a smart contract insurance on flight uh, delays. <clears throat> so it's very, very simple. I sign up or, and, and pay five euros um, in this system. So if my flight is delayed more than two hours, the system knows it instantly and I will get 230 euros into my account right away. No need to contact the insurance company. No need to uh, to involve any paperwork or anything because they the system gets the data from maybe the the airport, the central airport system, uh, and it executes right away. And for you, for for those of you who's who's been in Norway, that would have been nice to have uh, 230 additional euros because then you could buy maybe one beer and one pizza in the airport. Good. Um, so that was an example of a smart, how smart contracts uh, on the blockchain can, can be very powerful in, uh, in, in, in make, make, making things more efficient. So Vitalik Buterin, he's one of the pioneers in the blockchain space right now. And he was uh, the inventor or the, the, the developer of uh, the Ethereum blockchain, uh, which some of you might have, um, have uh, seen. He puts it very nicely, I think. Because we, we're talking a whole lot of, uh, uh, about how new technologies are automating work and people won't have any work and whatnot. But the thing about blockchain is that compared to most technologies, it doesn't actually automate um, the menial tasks. It automates away the sensor, as he puts it. So instead of putting the taxi driver out of a job, blockchain actually puts Uber out of a job and lets the taxi drivers work with the customer directly. So again, you're eliminating the central player and distribu distribu distributing the trust to the network. So if I had a blockchain solution, I no longer needed Uber to link up with someone who needs to be driven somewhere. So again, that's a, it's a very powerful way of, uh, of thinking about this. 
and pretty complex, I, I know. But hopefully things are much more clear when you take a look in, um, in, in the report. So moving a little bit away from blockchain, but not completely, um, but we also have to talk about this whole digital identity paradigm that's also uh, part of transforming how we think about trust in our digital age. So the point of departure is obviously that more and more of our daily activities, they migrate online. So it, it's probably not sufficient for very much longer to only be identified by a static credential, a passport, a social security card, uh, or whatever. And when we talk about digital identity, um, it's not only about uh, digitalizing these static credential. It's not only about e-passports um, and whatnot. No, it's actually a digital representation of, of one's uh, 360 degrees identity. So my behavior online um, and, you know, so, so my identity, it, it, it's, it's, it also shifts, it, it's dynamic because depending on the context you're engaging in online, your identity is defined by different things. So if I engage with, let's say, a vendor, Amazon maybe, it's more important, uh, the most important thing about my identity to them is probably the way I behave online and my preferences and whatnot. But when I interact with uh, government service, they are more interested in, it's, actually, it's Simon, he's a person, and this is his passport. Um, yes. But when you put the concept of digital identity together with blockchain, it actually multiplies a whole lot. And this is a very, very powerful way of thinking, if you ask me. The concept of self-sovereign identity. I don't know if any one of you have heard about self-sovereign identity before. But essentially what it means is that instead of, of uh, Amazon, Facebook, or any other entities out there owns my data, which they've collected, I'm actually in charge of my own data and it's stored in the blockchain so I can decide when, who, and how has access uh, to specific data about me. Um, and as I put it as the fourth bullet on this slide, it's a very, very groundbreaking idea, but there's a long way to go. There's a very long way to go because it's, it's simply, you know, it, it's a huge class of the way we think about, or at least the established players think about uh, identity today. But imagine, actually, let's, let's play with the thought here. Imagine the situation where I'm buying, let's say a book through Amazon um, from a, any given vendor, essentially, what Amazon and the bookseller needs to know about me is that Simon is a person and he can pay for this book and he's from Denmark. That's essentially what they need to know in order to make the transaction to buy the book. So if they got a hash, um, a digital hash where all my uh, data was uh, stored behind, they don't necessarily need to know my, my uh, payment detail, my preferences and whatnot. They actually only need to know that Simon's buying this book and he can actually pay for it. So once it's shipped, um, let's say DHL, they obviously need to know where to ship the book. So they need access to data about my address, but they don't need access about uh, data about my payment details and whatnot. So, I have, in a self-sovereign identity paradigm, or if we play with the idea, I have the opportunity to only share the data that is necessary to for a given transaction. But I could also decide to share more data with Amazon, maybe my uh, book preferences uh, and whatnot, and all sorts of data that they're collecting anyway today. If, if I had the power, I could decide myself to share with Amazon so they could tailor make uh, services for me because I might find that valuable. But the key is that I can decide myself what to share with. Uh, I, I'm the master of my own identity and I can, I can decide what to share and what not to share and when to share it. And that is to me at least a very, very powerful idea, even though it's, it's probably at least 
some years out in the future, to, 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 to say the least. A um, case on digital identity that I brought to you today is, well, it, it's, it's, it's the whole idea of this, or it's the whole uh, challenge of uh, what we've called the global identity challenge. I think it's the World Bank that estimates that approximately 1 billion people worldwide actually have no legal identity. So essentially, they are invisible in formal systems, and that significantly limits their access to basic services, to human rights, to jobs, to everything. So that's a huge problem. And I guess if you ask those per persons individually, they obviously know who they are, but the systems don't simply. So in a refugee, in a refugee camp in, in, in the northern part of Jordan, the Satari refugee camp, uh, there's the UN is currently testing uh, it's actually put in place already this blockchain based identity system where that's based on biometrics as well where syrian refugees who flee their country without maybe a passport or any physical evidence of their identity they are identified by this iris scanner as you see uh, on the picture so their unique identity is defined by their biometrics and that not only does it allow them to identify themselves as individuals, but it also allows um, the UN to save a whole lot of money instead of distributing uh, meal vouchers uh, or supermarket vouchers individually to each one of these refugees. They can now access the meal vouchers sort of, you know, digitally by identifying themselves um, based on the biometrics. So the vouchers are in their personal account, so to speak, and they can use it in the supermarkets in the refugee camp. And it also kind of um, makes the whole black market of vouchers, uh, at least to some extent, more limited. So that's very, very powerful for, for um, the people around the world that hasn't got any identity. All right, so to wrap things up a little bit here, um, are we seeing a paradigm shift in the making? I would definitely argue, yes, we are. And we've talked about the, how the declining trust in traditional trust facilitating institution is, is declining and it, it's almost hitting rock bottom. So the trust to uh, government institution is, is getting lower, the trust to banks, the trust to digital giants, it's all plummeting uh, these years because of the scandals. Um, and the lack of transparency that, that, that I explained earlier. And then we have the, the, the pull factors, which are these new advanced technologies that transforms trust. It allows us to create trust and facilitate trust in new ways. But to add to the mix, it's also we see that it's the younger generation that push this development forward, not only because they've grown up with the internet, they're much more comfortable with these, these new uh, technologies, but also the fact that they've they've grown up in a time like they've experienced these uh, what can you say trust uh, defaults like the increasing mistrust. So my parents' generation they might have a long relationship with the bank, and if the bank defaults on their trust, they might think that yeah we trust because they normally they normally don't default on our, our trust so we trust in the system because it's it's been trustworthy for so long but for younger generation they, they don't have the same experience of systems that's been trustworthy for so long um, and then to compare it to to the dot com boom we are also seeing massive investments in in these technologies huge huge investments venture capital and you know the financial sector established institu institutions are investing heavily in, 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 in these uh, technologies and it's both stupid money smart money all sorts of money that are being plowed into the, these technologies and just as we saw with the internet boom back in the 90s with huge investments probably creates a bubble which we are probably seeing right now where all the cryptocurrencies are really suffering but nonetheless, it was these huge investment that, that established the whole infrastructure for the paradigm, paradigm shift for the, the development, the further development of the technology. So we see similarities in, in, in 
how these massive investments were um, allowing the internet to transform uh, society back then to how these investments hopefully are, or maybe are allowing blockchain and, and digital identity and other technologies to transform society and trust today. <clears throat> this is a slide that I actually like a lot because when I talk about, I, I'm, you can probably hear that I'm a blockchain enthusiast, uh, at least to some degree, but it's always important to kind of see it from the other side because obviously the established institutions, the established middlemen, third parties and whatnot, obviously they're not just going to roll over and die. They are preparing for a battle and they're investing in this so heavily to come up with solutions on, on how to reestablish trust and how to utilize these new technologies um, <clears throat> to, um, to not lose the battle to these new alternatives. So that is what is going on with, um, with uh, the established in institutions right now. They are fighting to uh, obviously to, to maintain their positions because it's some of the most powerful institutions and digital giants who stand to lose a lot from this uh, development. So obviously they are um, preparing to, to, to fight back. And one example of that is actually um, um, the R R3 blockchain consortium. And that's a blockchain cons consortium that's supported by more than uh, 200 banks and financial institutions. And they work intensively uh, in, in developing new solutions for, for the financial sector in terms of, um, of utilizing these technologies to, uh, to do things more efficient and to do things more transparent in order to establish or uh, re-establish uh, trust. So as I, I again, I, I also I gave you the example earlier with how to how blockchain could change supply chain. So you're seeing established players utilizing this, but the huge difference is that before there were no alternatives to these centralized entities, centralized institutions. So instead of just being how to say um, facilitators of trust or trusted middlemen they kind of develop into gatekeepers of trust, so to speak. So they, let's, let's take banks as an example. They could decide who uh, to exclude. Um, and, and, and there's so many people around the world who, who doesn't have access to, uh, to bank accounts and, and whatnot. But the, the difference is that today, or, or the development that we see is, is creating an alternative to the, to the um, conventional to the traditional way of, of thinking about trust. So even though the established actors is, is doing what they can to reestablish trust, there is now an alternative that they have to, to, uh, to consider as well. And that's good for us as consumers, as citizens, uh, and that's challenging to, to the incumbents, uh, so to say. All right, so to wrap up things um, here. So we're seeing this, I've, I've, I've said it several times, we're seeing this um, shift towards more decentralized and distributed um, ways of thinking about trust. But it's not the same thing as saying as the centralized way of thinking of trust is going to be completely um, phased out. Of course, it's not going to be that. They're going to, these three different ways of thinking about trust, these three different trust systems are going to be, um, they, they're going to be there together, so to say. And they're going to complement each other and not, they're not necessarily going to compete against each, uh, each other, but the alternatives are there. <clears throat> and that also means that to a much lar larger degree, trust has to be embedded in the organization and in the products and the services that organizations develop, whether it be a commercial company or if, or if it's a, um, a government authority, trust needs to be at the core of the services and products provided. In recent years or in, 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 in the past few years, the, the whole disc that we've, we've been talking a lot about how touch points are becoming increasingly important, uh, the touch points between organizations and consumers. We'll argue here that 
actually trust points are becoming increasingly more important that might trump touch points at, at, at some point. So trust points so that consumers, citizens that they trust in, in the services and the products and in the organization itself. <clears throat> and then if we talk about the new ways of thinking about uh, data, personal data, it creates new, in the, in the self-sovereign identity paradigm, it creates new ways of thinking uh, about who has access to what data. So in the world where, and GDPR actually was sort of a step in that direction that, that we are allowed to, to, uh, to say to Facebook, for example, we'll have, we need you to delete my personal data. I, want you, I don't want you to keep my personal data anymore. That actually changes the whole game in terms of these organizations maybe in, to the same extent just cannot collect the data that they want, but instead they have to, to earn your trust or to, to kind of, you know, when they earn your trust, then you'll share data with them. So they have to, uh, to be trustworthy enough for you to share data. They, they simply can't in the distant future just rely on, on, on uh, collecting all the data that they need, the user data. But there's also, as I talked about a little bit before, there's also a whole, whole new social value proposition to this, to this changing trust paradigm. So these technologies has huge inclusive potential. Um, blockchain, for example, it has huge potential in terms of, 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 let's say, just including the unbanked into the world economy. So there's several billion people uh, across the globe also in, in Western countries that doesn't have access to a bank account. It's not only in Africa, but in Western countries as well. So with these technologies, who say that they actually need access to a bank account in, 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 in the near future if, if, if these technologies enables transactions in a new way without a bank as a middleman? So it has huge uh, inclusive potential. Um, also, the, the, the example on, on uh, the digital identity I, I gave you earlier. <clears throat> and in connection to that, there's the whole leapfrogging potentials, uh, potential um, that these technologies present to, to developing nations. And the concept of leapfrogging is basically skipping steps in technological development. And a, a great example of that is actually that most of Africa, they went from a situation where very few had access to internet to 4G networks where a lot of people suddenly had access to the internet. So there were no landlines across um, Africa really before the 4G technology allowed uh, the, the skipping of, of, of certain uh, technological development steps. So we see that blockchain and these technologies have some of the same leapfrogging potentials uh, for uh, de developing uh, countries. And then obviously when we talk about technological development and new technologies and new realities, the need for new skills uh, emerges. And that is also of, of course uh, the situation here. Um, the freelance platform Upwork an American freelance platform that facilitates freelance workers with tasks. They did an, um, a survey in, in, in Q3 of 2018, the third quarter of 2018, and the single most sought after skills, uh, skill set that uh, companies were uh, demanding from, from the freelancers were by far blockchain skills. So it also tells the story that companies out there are aware, they know that, that things are starting to move here and they know that we need to get on that train. So to, to end this presentation on a very consultancy-like uh, way, it is not a question if, but it's actually a question of when and how to, to engage in, in this new trust paradigm, how to utilize these new technologies to establish and maybe even reestablish trust in new ways. So I think actually that was the words from, from, from this webinar. 
I hope at least that you got some input out of it. It's always difficult to sit by your by yourself in a room and, and, and talking to to people online. But I'm happy to invite uh, questions in 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 the in the chat now, and I'll I'll uh, do my best to to give uh, answers. Please. I've actually, I've seen we are only eight people left, so I've actually unmuted all of you. So please just give me any questions now. Um, you don't have to type it in the chat. Simon, it was very good. I don't have any questions. You were very thorough and I really liked both aspects of digital transformation of trust that you included both how blockchain will change the paradigm and the and also how the digital identity, the concept of digital identity will change how we think about facilitating trust. Very well done. Thank you very much. So I can see that Ola is, uh, he, he wonders if there's any tool to do blockchain without programming. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but, um, and I'm not sure I can actually give a, a good answer because I'm not as such a technical guy that knows how to progr program uh, blockchains, but I know there is blockchain as a as a service services out there, just as you would find cloud storage as a service and AI as a service. So there are business models around uh, people without deep blockchain knowledge who can actually you know kind of access blockchain services and embed it in their business models. I know they they exist. I hope that was an answer. Any other questions, reflections? I will definitely encourage all of you to, um, to um, have a read, read the report. It's accessible on our website already, and uh, it will also be sent in a physical copy to uh, to all the members organizations so you'll probably have access to a physical copy as well and then obviously please 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 reach out to me if uh, you have any further questions and i'm happy to take a, a dialogue around this and um, thanks so much for uh, for tuning in and i hope that you got it's always difficult with webinars but i hope that uh, at least it, it gave you some perspectives and some insight into uh, into this Thank you all.